Welcome, Wargamers, to the thick kelp forests of the mortal realms, because today we are talking all about the Eidneth Deepkin, with a story straight out of their battle tome. Now, before I get into that, I do want to give a huge thank you and shout out to my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to follow along, see pictures of my cat, uh, hobby progress, all these kinds of things, I would immensely appreciate you stopping by there. Those folks are integral to supporting me, my wife, this channel, all of it, and I could not be more thankful. So huge shout out to you guys. I hope to see you there. Now, like I said, today's story comes out of the Eidneth Deepkin battle tome, and it's called Forests of the Deep. Alariel has oft been given cause to mistrust the Deepkin enclaves, for they have been known to prey upon the soul pods of her children. Yet the Briomdar earn the goddess's favor through their resolute defense of the kelp forests that blanket the Green Gulch in Garan, which have expanded fourfold since the Everqueen's great rite of life was performed. In several fierce campaigns, the stealthy and merciless kelp stalkers of Briomdar joined forces with the ocean-dwelling dryads and sylvaneth of the Heartwood Glade to drive invading hosts of maggotkin from these forests of the sea. In return for their vigilant protection of nature's bounty, the Briomdar earned the Everqueen's blessing. Strange, ethereal warsong revenants visit the Corellium of the reclusive enclave, and their haunting pipe song causes the spirit reefs to glimmer and surge with vital energies. Okay, so we have a lot to unpack here because it's an introduction to a sub-faction of the Eidneth that we don't talk about a whole lot, and also Alariel, who doesn't show up a ton uh, as much as she used to anyway, like in the Rumgate Wars. Now, for those of you who are new to the game or the faction of the Eidneth Deepkin, these are the underwater elves you may have seen, some of the most striking models Games Workshop has ever put to plastic. They are essentially Teclis's first attempt to recreate the elven race from the old world in the Age of Sigmar. However, there was some flaw in these souls that basically one in every hundred of their kids would be normal. The other 99 would be like born like soulless. And so this is why you have the Namardi class. Those are the ones that have no eyes. Those are the ones who are born soulless. And then there's the Isheron or kind of like the higher tier. Uh, not just the Isheron, the Akelian as well. So Akelian means like the warrior cast. Isheron is more the magic and, and ritual focused. And then below them are all of the Namardi. And they exist in this kind of loop of going out and raiding to get souls of other enemies. And it could be anything. Humans, dwarves, orcs, doesn't matter. They'll take anything that they can get, bring them back to their underwater bases. They decided to live underwater to hide from Teclis where he wouldn't look in the crushing dark and depth. And then put these souls into their young to basically give them a race. It's how they stave off an extinction level problem. Now the Eidneth Deep can have enclaves all over the place. They've actually spread and become quite prolific. And the way that they can do that is they basically just keep hidden. Secrecy is the name of the game when it comes to them because they live, again, super deep under the ocean in the darkest depths where everything's kind of gross and hard to reach and hard to see. They've learned to basically uh, command coral, if you can imagine that. That's what the Corellium was. Essentially, they can use natural formations and life magics to create safe environments. Then, with their magics of the ether sea, they can make it breathable. And boom, you have a hidden home under the sea. Now, the Briomdar, which are the, kind of the heroes of this story, so to speak, are an enclave of Eidneth Deepkin that resides specifically in Giran, the realm of life. And a little bit about them, they essentially uh, were part of the largest enclave, the Iron Rack, and basically the city just got too big. I mean, at a certain point, if secrecy is your game, overpopulation is a real problem all the time, because you can't be going around taking too many souls, too many resources, it'll draw attention. And so the Briomdar split off, and I kind of see them as being almost like a pioneer-style enclave. By that I mean they're reclusive, even for Deepkin standards, they don't want to work with others. They want to get as far away from everyone as possible, there were no other enclaves in Kiran when they arrived. They don't need much, want much, or do much. And by do much I mean they don't take a, an incredible amount of souls, it's a rather small enclave, and they want it that way because it keeps them secret. And the battle tome points out that the Briomdar have adapted to Giran spectacularly. And, and really, the thing that sets them apart is their ability to navigate the realms. All of the enclaves are going to have, like, cartographers and, and people who can help guide them. They have the soul scryers to be able to lead them through the darkest depths of the Aether Sea and, and get to places. But the Briomdar take that a step further, and they basically use the natural environment that they have studied 
very, very deeply to their advantage. And when you combine, you know, the battlefield being in your favor with the hit and run tactics that the Deepkin are known for, it's incredibly decisive when it comes to combat. They have a deep respect for uh, nature, everything around them. They want to keep their personal environment healthy, whole. Why? Because it means less eyeballs are on it. Again, it's a natural kind of symbiotic relationship between them and everything around them. Their beasts have uh, grown different kinds of camouflage to be able to blend in and that kind of thing. Now, if you've never seen a kelp forest, they're actually quite amazing. And the idea of one of these eels hurling through here at light speed just sounds rad. Now, this battle that was talked about where the Briomdar showed up and, and really helped Alariel's children and her forces push back Nurgle and, and I'm sure Skaven, Beastman, I'm, all those things were in Giran, was massive. And, and what a great way to earn trust, right? Like, if you're not going to go out and be social with other factions, you can at least earn the trust of one important person. In Giran, the only important person is Alariel. She's the one letting you live in her, basically her backyard. And so, when Alariel asks, they say, yes, absolutely. You know, I mean, between wanting to protect their environment and their own safety, because if Nurgle pollutes the whole ocean, none of it matters, right? It doesn't matter how isolated they are. If the water's poison, they're not going to do well. So they agree to join in, and just through acts of heroism, their hatred of chaos, which they do, they do legitimately hate chaos forces, and their ability to work alongside the Sylvaneth, even though some of their uh, kin from other enclaves has been known to raid Sylvaneth soul pods, they come to this mutual understanding and Alariel says like, you know what, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but, but Briomdar, you guys are okay. Which is the closest thing to a high five I think we'll ever see in Warhammer lore. Now what's interesting here, a few things, is that this story, uh, it's from the newer Eidnithyukin battle tome, and it, it gives us actually a pretty firm sense of time. This is actually a very recent event that Briomdar has earned the trust and favor of Alariel. And we know this because the kelp forest that they help protect recently expanded almost four times over when Alariel did her Rite of Life. And if you don't know, that is from the Broken Realms Kragnos book. It starts off with Alariel doing this huge ritual to basically try and reverse the death magic that Nagash has saturated the realms with, with a life one. And so beasts get angry, um, Flora starts booming with life all across the realms. Kragnos is energized and bursts out of the mountain. Little unintended consequence there, setting loose a whole new deity of wrecking ball. But here in Giran, it also booms the natural life within the oceans. And after, you know, the Briomdar help defend this particular part of Giran, Alariel sees fit to send them some ambassadors to say, like, I'm going to show you my appreciation. So she sends over a pair of Warsong Revenants, and essentially, if you don't know how that worked out in the, the Broken Realms Kragnos, it's a new unit that came about, and essentially they have an aspect of Alaria with them. They're able to kind of carry the power of pure life with them wherever they go. They're kind of like the trumpeter models that are walking around. Well, when you send one of those underwater, they basically just imbue the entire enclave with power, might, and life magic. And this is incredibly important for them. And I was thinking about, like, okay, she didn't pay them. She didn't call beasts their way. Like, how does this help? And then the other day, I was actually watching a, uh, a documentary, an a underwater documentary, talking about the little weird ways that life finds to exist under the crushing depths and darkness. And the truth is, it, it struggles to exist because there's so little nutrients there like there's so much dirt and rock and stuff like that but there's no raw materials for life no organics and so her showing up or sorry the warsong revenants rather showing up underwater into these dark reclusive places and then just injecting it with pure life what that means is they can build way better defenses out of the coral they can expand all of their um their ways that they recover souls and stuff like that like their reserves more homes, more beds, more uh, stables for their animals. You know, stables being a loose term if your animal is an eel. But essentially, I mean, t to me, my reckoning of just injecting that much raw life and energy into something where it's so dark and removed that all, every little bit counts is the equivalent of us playing like Age of Empires and you hit the level up thing on your settlement and your whole civilization levels up. Like I can easily see that being the gift that she gave them. And what a gift it would be if you are a pioneer out there village, relatively small, very largely isolated, having this huge injection of raw material and energy and all this kinds of stuff, it would be a massive boon for them. Why Alariel couldn't take a portion of souls from, I don't know, soul pods, the belly of Slanesh, I don't know, anyway, and just hand them over, I don't know. But 
that's what she chose to do. So she gave them the tools that they need to thrive, not just survive. And actually, I think that that's a really cool way of extending, like, gratitude when you talk about the nature of these armies and all their motivations and especially with these guys like where they're kind of this weird failed half elf type thing in the face of alariel who is a god of the elves right that there's a there's an awkward step ant relationship here that nobody needs to dig too far into and so it's just kind of nice to see someone be like here's some tools you can need to survive you have to survive on your own like she's not giving them an army or anything like that but you're welcome in this place. And not only are you welcome, but I'm going to give you everything you need to expand. You are my defenders of the coast or something like that. And so let's move into why is this story cool? Honestly, any time that factions interact, I love to highlight that. Because in truth, like uh, I did the Fire Slayer video before and there's a lot of drama in, you know, internal friction between like Hermdar undercutting prices because they're honorable rather than just trying to make money. But I do love when there's external stuff as well. The Deepkin, like I said, do have a very complicated past when it comes to elven deities. Like they're straight up terrified of Teclas who wants to kill them. Uh, Tyrion, they're kind of indifferent to slash, you know, throwing the peace sign out because he let them escape. Marathi has kind of slithered her way into control of, not control, that's a strong word. I'm not going to take that back. But slithered her way into the Iron Rack because she hired Volturnus to work for her during Broken Realms Marathi. So like there's some connection there that is a bit vague. How much they actually like slash trust each other is uh, it's tenuous at best. And then with Malarian, there's just a big question mark we've had for the last like six years of this game. So I'm saying is they don't have a lot of deities to run to and, and hide behind. And so having one good affiliation, like at a certain point in this setting, you man, you just, you just got to make friends with somebody. <laughs> and I think Alariel is a pretty strong choice right now. I also think this battle is a, is a great mix of practical and honorable. By that I mean the Deepkin had a completely practical reason to stop the Nurgle stuff. If they poison, poison the ocean and the waterways, their home gets affected too. But more than that, they went out and above and beyond and, and attacked the enemy in the kelp forest where it had expanded into. It wasn't even a part of their original lands. They went above and beyond and a god took the time to be like, I see you, you done good. Now, I honestly I would love to see the books about this story because it's after the Rite of Life, so life magic is booming in Giran of all places, of course. And Nurgle, and what was the other force there? Oh, it's just Magikin. Okay, so uh, let me read this part here again. The kelp stalkers of Briondar joined forces with ocean-dwelling dryads, period. I'm just going to put that there. That's an interesting concept. I would love to see an army about that, like Driftwood Sylvaneth and Sylvaneth of the Heartwood Glade. So we know the Heartwood Glade to drive the invading hosts of Maggotkin from these forests of the sea. And so I would love that story because you would essentially, I mean, to be honest, I would love to see it from the Nurgle perspective. Like they just have their ships and weird things start happening around them. Maybe branches and logs start coming up from the depths and like punching holes in the bottom of the ship it's actually tree lords under the water hooking whole sunken trees upwards and then we can see from their perspective as the mist rolls in and the briomdar start attacking and, and what that looks like and what that kind of warfare is i think could be a very compelling novel or even short story i mean if they attack like the briomdar are talked about attacking where it's very quick decisive they use the terrain to their advantage i can't imagine it would be a long protracted battle but it could be an interesting insight into how all of these factions address combat at sea and that would be a really cool thing to see or read about but anyway friends those are just my thoughts i thoroughly enjoyed this story i hope you do as well as someone who just gets absolutely entranced by nature documentaries everything from the dark crushing depths of the ocean to the vibrant kelp forest there was just a lot of imagery that got me excited about this story and uh it's something that has always kind of drawn me towards the deepkin not enough to play them but certainly enough to want to keep up with them lore wise Tell me your thoughts about it in the comments down below. I will look forward to communicating with you there. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.